Welcome all. Thanks so much for joining us for our webinar. We are excited to be hosting our next International Education Professional Development webinar on how is your international team structured, identifying gaps and maximizing resources. This is what I'm sure will be a lively and fascinating conversation. My name is Ellie Butler and I am Head of Marketing for North America at IDP Connect. And in this session, we'll be speaking with three institutions that have unique international team structures within their organizations to discuss efficiencies, what works well and what doesn't, and how you can make the most of your structure in your institution. Today will be part presentation and part panel discussion. And as you likely know, we asked you as our attendees to submit questions ahead of time for the panel discussion, and we received some really interesting submissions. So thank you for those, and we're looking forward to covering them in the second half of the webinar. This session will be recorded, and the recording in the slides will be shared with you following the webinar. So if we move along to our next slide, I will introduce our expert panel of speakers. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by Kelpin Trevetti, Vice Provost for Global Affairs at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Andrew Ness, Dean of International at Humber College, and Jim Monahan, Director of Graduate and International Admissions at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. For our panel discussion, we'll also be joined by Christine Walk, Director of Client Partnerships for North America. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And just quickly before we jump into the content of our presentation today, I will give a very brief introduction to IDP for those of you who may not know us. IDP Education is a world leader in international student placement services and digital recruitment solutions. We are a proud co-owner of the IELTS exam and we are a leading event management company of global education events. We're the strategic partner of choice for institutions when it comes to international recruitment and marketing. We are well known for our vast network of counselors around the world. We send students from more than 30 countries, which you can see pictured here in the orange, to English speaking destination countries pictured here in the yellow. We also have the world's largest digital network pictured on our next slide for prospective international students. And we receive over 100 million annual visits to our 40 connected websites across hot courses and idp.com. Jumping into today's conversation, again, we'll be discussing international team structures at three institutions who have unique international team structures. We'll talk about what works at each, at each, each institution, what doesn't, contingencies and opportunities. And just before we jump into each institution's presentation, we did want to establish a set of truisms that need to be considered when discussing this topic. So together, the great minds on today's panel established the following truisms. So there is no perfect organizational structure, but there are perfect conditions for an ideal organizational structure. Changing an organizational structure does not guarantee a different set of outcomes, better performance or efficiency. It's often easier, that is cheaper or quicker, to, take an organizational, to change an organizational structure rather than make fundamental changes to improve performance. And finally, collaboration with other units, including academic and student services on campus is critical and must be prioritized. So some very important truisms that we want to establish before we jump into today's conversation. And with that, I will pass to Kelpin Trevetti at UMass Amherst to discuss his institutional structure. Thank you, Elle. So a quick uh, introduction to the institution itself. We are the flagship campus of the University of Massachusetts Systems. So we're a large public research intensive uh, R1, if you like, university located in Western Massachusetts, a couple of hours from Boston. And um, here are some numbers that give you a sense of our size and scale. We have about 24,000 undergraduates, 10% of whom are international. 7,800 graduate students, about 27% of whom are international. Um, world ranking programs. Uh, we're a top 26 uh, public university in the US. And uh, one of our points of pride is that we have the nation's number one 
dining, college dining, uh, as, as rated several years in a row now by the Princeton Review, about $290 million in research expenditure, 370 research labs or groups thereabout. So a large comprehensive full-scale public university in New England. Our, and as you might expect, as we'll see on the next slide, our international structure is therefore quite um, sort of disparate and, and dispersed throughout the, the system. So um, for a lot of the international activities they would traditionally associate in an international office fall under me in the international programs office. So that would be international student and scholar services that would deal with international orientation, any kind of education abroad exchange. So the outgoing side of the house, uh, global partnerships, agreements, international travel management, global engagement. So we centralize all of those in the International Programs Office. The one piece that we, um, I suppose, a couple of things that we don't centralize under my office, one is international admissions. So undergraduate international admissions sit under enrollment management, still within the provost division, so a close office uh, and an ally. Um, and then our international graduate admissions are extremely diffuse. So the various schools and colleges have a role to play in it, as well as the graduate schools. So still within academic affairs, within the provost side of the house. Um, and then our English as a second language provision is in the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Um, so again, you know, we do a lot of the international uh, work within the provost's area. Other than that, the two pieces I would note, one is the new student orientation that takes place under the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs um, unit. And so we collaborate with them quite strongly. This goes back to the truism, one of the truisms earlier, that collaboration across various units is really going to be um, key to success, no matter what your organizational structure is. And then the other is the Vice Chancellor for Research's office uh, through whom we work on international research compliance pieces. So what works for us um, in our structure? I think we have a really um, strategic oversight in terms of undergraduate recruitment and admissions, both sort of domestically and internationally. It's a lean and efficient model run through the enrollment management office. We don't really employ a lot of recruiters, uh, no commercial partnerships. But it's, uh, you know, we have a couple of folks who travel within that unit, although really not in the last two years or so. But a lot of it is done by building very strong relationships with, um, you know, college counselors and particular feeder high schools and identifying markets that where we have strong, um, uh, we've had strong historical performance and making sure that we continue to leverage and develop those. And so, as I say, that happens out of the enrollment management office. I think what works really well is the international programs office. My office is a sort of centralizing hub for all these global activities. So even the things that we don't do directly, we touch upon in some way, shape or form. And, um, you know, we coordinate several uh, groups, uh, committees uh, that meet regularly throughout the year that support all of the international activities, whether it be for recruitment, for student success, for risk management. Um, so even without having direct oversight or responsibility for some of the pieces of the activity, we still sort of work as a, a kind of a hub or a you know building connective tissue across different parts of the university to make sure that the, the work is done. Um, and this has led, you know, more recently to some uh, work around an international research strategy that we're developing, which I will talk about again in a, in a second. The places where things don't work for us or haven't worked as well, I'd say, you know, um, is on the graduate recruitment side, where the recruitment has been very catch as catch can. Um, by various academic units, departments, programs, often relying on the strength of the, the quality and the reputation of the programs or connections that faculty have forged uh, through their own research networks. But there has, there's no coherent yield activity. There is no kind of controlling intelligence. There's no uh, strategic oversight or hasn't been until recently. Um, 
And this leads to some inconsistent expectations from academic units around how the logistics are managed, how I-20s or when I-20s are issued around fellowships, assistantships, what can be waived, what can't be waived, what is the cost structuring in there. And then we haven't really paid a lot of attention to our international alumni network and to think about ways in which they could both be kind of leveraged into some, uh, some sort of uh, recruitment scenario, but also as potential um, career development or employment prospects back in the home countries for students, because not every student who comes to the US is going to want to stay in the US. And so I think for us, that's a, a missing piece of the puzzle that, that we're only now beginning to um, spend some time uh, thinking about. So I think more to come um, on that side of things. So if we go to the next slide, which sort of thinks about contingencies and the way in which we have uh, interpreted contingencies for the purposes of this discussion today is really to be thinking around, you know, what are the existing realities that we have to work around that, or that we have to work within? Um, and so for us, you know, our budget model, which is a hybrid RCM, uh, you know, resource-centered management, revenue-centered management, I think most people are familiar with RCM, um, it creates different incentives for different units. So what this means is that not every academic or administrative unit um, sees, sees it within their incentive structure or sees it within their, uh, I suppose, benefit to wholly swing behind any international recruitment effort that we may or may not be trying to undertake. So I think you know, we have to approach different units differently. There are some myths and misinformation around sort of the motives behind international recruitment uh, that are, I think, on a lot of campuses, but I think specifically on ours, uh, that we need to factor into any sort of planning or strategy. Uh, so, for example, I think there is some concern around the ethics of international recruitment that perhaps uh, some recruiters might be driven entirely by uh, a commercial motive that as a university, as a public university, as a land grant university with a mission to educate the citizens of the state, we, you know, we may have some moral concerns around thinking about recruitment purely in commercial terms when it might bring uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds or uh, the global south to pay high fees. So I think those sorts of uh, questions really need to be factored into anything that we might do more centrally. Um, and we have been trying to pay some more attention recently. So in the last year and a half, uh, I, my, ta my office and I have been tasked with coming up with, uh, with a sort of strategic plan for graduate international recruitment, which as I said, has not really been um, happening hitherto. There's also this real need to firewall undergraduate international admissions from any professional or commercial recruitment efforts that we might undertake, because we've had some bad experiences, uh, either through sort of international academy relations or through some, um, shall we say, unauthorized contracts that were signed without um, buy-in or permission at the higher levels that some staff members had done, which I think led to some uh, reputational uh, fallout, especially on the undergraduate side. You know, when I think students in a, in a lot of countries are very conscious about the reputation of the university to which they're applying. And when, you find yourself being listed or represented by an agent with a whole lot of universities um, where you don't think they're your peer institutions or you don't want to be seen as being part of that group, that can have some uh, ad adverse effects and had some adverse effects for us on the undergraduate admission side. And because our undergraduate admission side works extremely well, um, you know, we really need to make sure that we're not messing with that piece, which kind of goes to the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, you know, we, our undergraduate side works well, and we're not looking to make, you know, any changes uh, or structural or procedural or otherwise, but we do need to do some work on the graduate side, which we have begun to do. Our ESL provision is weak, and perhaps let me explain what I mean by that. So our ESL provision is 
um, specifically sort of related to um, summer provision, uh, upskilling, getting students who have been admitted um, ready for academic classes and academic writing. But it's not, we don't really have the kind of infrastructure where we can use ESL as a means of sort of conditional admits or a pathway into the university. And that's again, not likely to change. Uh, I should perhaps have used the word change rather than improve there, but yeah. You know. um, and again, you know, to go back to the, the, the truism, I mean, for a university like ours where the, uh, international activities are, are so dispersed throughout the organizational structure, we really need to make sure that we know whom to collaborate with and that we are open to working across different units. So what are some of the opportunities that I see? The first of these for us at UMass is this new graduate international recruitment plan rollout. So over the last year and a half, we've had a lot of conversations with the various schools and colleges on campus to get some sense of what sorts of um, international student growth they want to see. Uh, I think in some cases it's capacity and numbers, in others um, programs want to diversify the international populations that they have because there's two, you know, there's, there's been over-reliance on one um, sending country rather than another. I think in some of our STEM fields, for example, there's a desire to have greater gender or nationality or a nation of origin diversity in terms of getting more women, more students from the global south into those programs in ways that we haven't hitherto. So just sort of identifying who wants to do what in the international graduate recruitment side, and then making a plan and, and coming up with some solutions, uh, some of which are commercial solutions, uh, and rolling those out across the university, I think, which we've just begun to do, uh, is a real opportunity for us. And I'm, I'm sort of excited by um, making that happen uh, and, and seeing how that works out in the next couple of years. We have um, this new international research strategy that I mentioned that is under development. And I think one of the positive outcomes of that will be that we'll be able to see some more synergy across our strategic partnerships and recruitment. So, but what I mean by that is that if we are able to build stronger sort of bilateral research focused um, arrangements with a handful of key universities uh, where we know we have a good deal of um, you know, uh, overlap in terms of research focus, faculty interests, um, joint labs, then that will also have a positive impact on recruiting international students in both directions, I think. We have a new provost starting in, the, in this summer and so the, the, pre, the current provost who's been, I think, very supportive of international in all its aspects. And, and, that, and in fact, he was the one who tasked me with trying to get this international graduate recruitment strategy underway. But I think it'll, you know, the new provost is also very interested in making sure that our international graduate numbers continue to be strong and continue to be diverse. And I think there's, there's some opportunity there to do uh, perhaps more exciting things once we get good data from our first year or two of recruitment. And the last thing I'll mention is that um, we've had a number of um, accelerated master's programs, so one-year master's that have been developed across various academic units in the university, which in turn I think is giving a lot of scope uh, and a lot of ideas around campus for the articulation arrangements of kind of your four plus one or one plus one that would that that are made easy by the fact that we can now complete an entire master's in one year. And so I think you know that's an opportunity that we can help academic units capitalize on by thinking about where might we find some strategic fit and strategic match, which again, I think goes back to the research strategy. So I think there's a lot of things coming together right now that, that um, mean the horizon is very good for international graduate recruitment for us. And, and so glad to be working on that um, at this point. So I will stop here and turn over to my colleague, Andrew Ness from Toronto, who will introduce himself and his institution before uh, giving us his presentation. 
Cheers. Thanks very much, Kalpin. Really appreciate your comments and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you and very thankful to see so many familiar uh, names in the chat uh, from both sides of the border. Happy to share uh, uh, the Humber perspective. Uh, and I'll start with our organizational structure, which you'll see on the screen in a second. Uh, pardon me. I'll start with I'll go back one slide, pardon me. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Humber or indeed with the system that, that we work with uh, here, uh, I dubbed us one of Canada's largest polytechnics. And that term is problematic uh, if you're not familiar with really what that means. So in, in uh, the way I've come to describe polytechnic in our context is breadth of credentials. So we started as a two-year school for our, our American colleagues and really morphed into and grew over time over the 50 plus years we've been um, uh, serving the community here uh, to not only one year certificates, two year diplomas, three year advanced diplomas. We have a whole suite of bachelor's degrees, uh, 40, plus we have 80 postgraduate uh, certificate programs. Uh, so uh, if you think of a Western European uh, polytechnic, uh, we have very similar characteristics to that kind of uh, breadth of offering. Uh, applied learnings. Um, uh, hard hard coded into our DNA, and many institutions say that. Why do I say it that way? Say it because in our legislation, we uh, are required, mandated, to have advisory committees from industry inform all of our programs. We're required to conduct that, to document it, to minute it, and to uh, help inform our curriculum. So, as opposed to a more traditional bicameral governance structure we have industry informing curriculum, which means there's a fluidity to uh, what's being delivered in the classroom and uh, uh, a more direct connection to some of the career outcomes. And that falls in line, of course, with the industry connections. We have north of 30,000 students across 180 programs. Of those 6,000 or so are international from 120 countries. And my department uh, includes, as you can see, marketing, recruitment, admissions, international student and scholar services, mobility and global academic partnerships and international development. So now I'll move to the organizational structure slide. Thank you. Uh, and you can see here, and I've highlighted in green, which areas um, come under my responsibility. And a couple of things I'd like to highlight for you here. So our focus is internationalization writ large. So what's um, perhaps distinctive in terms of the way the structure is built is that we are meant to be stewards of internationalization within Humber. And we wield that in a variety of different ways. And that includes, as you can see on the far right side of that org structure, international enrollment. Uh, so important to recognize that there's actually a domestic enrollment side, which is to the left there, and an international enrollment side. There is an AVP enrollment at registrar who's exceptional and a great um, colleague and, and terrific at her work and really is the leader on the enrollment side. But we have a, really a contained uh, cradle to grave enrollment unit. So we run essentially two parallel admissions operations um, with an aggregate goal in mind. And uh, we, in effect, horse trade back and forth with seats as we get closer to start term, uh, start of term, and, and to make sure we meet the aggregate goal number. Uh, in addition, um, we also have global education, which includes mobility, it includes uh, COIL, global academic partnerships, et cetera. International development, about $12 million in capacity development projects. Our priority areas are Africa and um, Asia, although we are working in South America and bidding on projects in the Caribbean at this point as well, plus international student and scholar services. So if we could flip to uh, the next slide, I, I, I'll just talk through sort of what's working and what's not. Uh, and I, the first comment I made was um, proximity to the academic engine. Uh, and I framed it that way because when I joined Humber six years ago, uh, this department reported up through advancement as it happened. And that was, uh, there's historical reasons why that was the case. Um, but we worked hard, particularly culturally, to, to really emulate and amplify and um, support and integrate with the academic engine of, of the institution. Subsequently, and just through retirements and some other moves, the international unit lock, stock and barrel was moved under the provost about two years ago. And so that alignment actually has proven to be even more beneficial. And I, I would say mutually beneficial in terms of 
the work that we're able to do with my uh, academic leadership colleagues. Uh, that also has allowed us to have really clear and transparent goal alignment uh, within the division. Humber is a very unique institution as far as my own experience in that uh, we are wholly committed and wedded to meeting the outcomes as defined in the strategic plan. I know, and I have had experiences with different institutions where we have a strategic planning exercise, but it really doesn't bear any resemblance to the day-to-day -day operations or the kind of funding or support we get. We are wholly wedded to planning and the outcomes of the planning. So being within the academic division allows us to really focus our efforts to amplify the goals in the academic plan and in the strategic plan. I was really interested to hear Kalpin use the term centralizing hub. And uh, I'll be honest, I actually didn't catch this before the webinar started, but, and I would use the term hub and spoke, and it's a similar concept in that our global education unit acts as uh, the, the campus leader for internationalization activities in terms of outbound, inbound study abroad, faculty-based um, faculty -based travel, uh, which is, by the way, is all credit bearing. We're really um, adamant about having credit bearing activity uh, solely. They run our global summer school, uh, global systems gap challenge, and uh, acad global academic partnerships. And I say hub and spoke because the senior deans be, uh, in consultation collaboration have built out their own um, capacity. So each faculty, and there's six, have their own people that actually are working on some of these projects, but it's really a hub and spoke model. Uh, I mean, euphemistically called the, the study abroad squad. Um, it's much more than that, but that's really the, the global engine hub and spoke model and it's working um, really well. We have direct connections to the, at the senior dean level, but also in terms of the operations of the faculties. So I, I, the next point is the institution believes in its global mission and vision. And um, well, what does that mean? So if you go to and I look up the Humber strategic plan, the vision of Humber is transforming polytechnic education through global polytechnic leadership. So it, it really almost is an entree or an invitation um, to embrace internationalization in all its forms. And so Humber understands its role uh, to, to provide global polytechnic leadership and encourages and embraces and supports and um, funds uh, innovation to allow us to do that. So in terms of my own department's ability to work with our academic colleagues and with others to really amplify Humber's mission, uh, it's actually hard coded into who we are as an institution. I will say what also works is smart people. I would love to lay claim to successes, but in fact, we've been very fortunate to be able to, to bring in some tremendous uh, leaders of their own right in international development, in global education, in enrollment uh, functions. And so we've, we've benefited greatly. Uh, and that may be a function of Humber's position. Certainly we're in the largest city in the country. Uh, we have uh, a pretty good, position uh, across the country. So I, you know, it's, it's a good place to be able to attract smart folks, but that's uh, a huge uh, assistance in, in us working. Not about so much the org structure, but it does help us. So, and this, uh, this is characterized as what doesn't work, but I guess I would frame it slightly differently. It, it's not that it doesn't work, but it, is a, it can be challenging if there's two separate, separate enrollment units. And I said this earlier, I'll say it again, our AVP and registrar is, is a superb enrollment leader and her folks that, that, uh, that drive a lot of the domestic enrollment, tremendous and collaborations, fantastic. And really we're two sides of the same coin. It's challenging depending on the ups and downs of the different enrollment populations. We've seen explosive application growth. So we've just, we're just finishing up our May term intake and we had year over year, 118% uh, increase in applications. 118 percent uh, for fall so far we're 49 percent up in applications so it, 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 the fact that it's essentially a fixed set of resources in the two shops it's hard to sort of work through and and access one set of resources to be able to support the other we're just starting to work on that but that 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 is ostensibly a limitation i, I i've struggled um, to understand at an organizational level how uh, a service department, like our admissions department can make the case 
for investment in maintenance, so upgrading services infrastructure. And, and I wonder if it's organizational, if it's cultural, or if it's sectoral. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, that and I, I imagine a number of you on the call share the same challenge, where we need investment in software. And it's not just buy the big, cool piece of software like Salesforce or people software, what have you. It's then constantly upgrading. It, it's as if we have bought an assembly line and then we just trust that it's going to work and we don't maintain it. We don't invest in it. We don't provide innovation. And so how do we secure that? And how do we make the case um, to invest in maintenance as opposed to um, the shiny objects that are interesting? And I think of that specifically with technology. I think it's a challenge of the structure. Uh, we all compete for scarce resources. I mean, it's not particularly challenging piece for me, but it's, you're always, I'm always mindful in an academic division as to what the opportunity cost of me getting resources would be to say a faculty in terms of equipment or a faculty in terms of another uh, faculty resource or um, innovative project, uh, because the primacy of the academic uh, activity always plays in mind. The other challenge I think with the way we're structured, and I, I use this sort of goofy way to frame it, but all things international, we ain't. And what I mean by that is that it seems that the fact that it says international center over the door of our office, um, that people assume that anything international, oh, they'll just do it. It's almost as if it's a place on campus as opposed to internationalization really being permeated through throughout. And um, there are some activities best left for other departments that are tremendously skilled. And I think in particular student affairs with career services or counseling services, the fact that our international students need counseling services, we're not equipped or skilled or, or even uh, are trained to do that. Yet people think, oh, it's international, they'll be able to deal with all of it. So it's breaking down that notion that international takes care of every single thing possible for uh, the international students. And I would say that's as has been, it's not right now, but it has been a challenge as much internally where we think we need to take that stewardship as in the community itself. So I've also listed some contingencies, which you'll see on the next slide. Uh, and the reason I framed this as contingencies is say, you know, this is kind of outside the organizational structure issue, but I, I see these as, as uh, contingent on the way in which um, the way in which you can actually work from the point you're working from. And the first is, what's, what's the institution's approach to strat plans, planning, and meeting goals? And, and I, I mentioned that it's almost a planning culture. And what's been intriguing to me to observe over the last six years is that because of the way Humber has a, approached its, its plans as in terms of commitments and resourcing, it allows me to advance internationalization activities because I fall, I'm aligned very clearly um, with what the overall goals are. Uh, sometimes yes, and sometimes no, not so much, but it's clear. So I, it, it's a more transparent roadmap for me to figure out where to go. Second is the leading from the side comment. And for those of you that know John Hudson at Michigan State, I, I, I heard him use this expression at NAFSA years ago, and I thought that was a brilliant way to frame uh, a lot of the uh, challenges that internationalization leaders face, and that is that we don't typically lead divisions. I thought Kalpin framed that so well as he talked about collaboration. So how do we lead from the side? How do we influence, for instance, my senior dean colleagues? Um, how do we build trust and, and mutual respect and, and try to have some sort of mutually beneficial activities? Uh, and that's true in the service departments as well. Uh, I think a lot of what we're able to do is contingent on the willingness of our internal service partners. And I've listed finance, HR, legal, and purchasing. Realizing that, you know, to work in international education requires a, a different frame. And it may be payments, it may be taxes, it may be procedural, uh, and, and uh, you really have to adapt. And certainly Humber started, our beginnings were pretty modest. We're a community college based in Toronto. We really weren't meant to move beyond our little wee corner of the earth. And now we're a truly global player moving hundreds of millions of dollars around the world. Well, that requires different thinking, not only in terms of the way we engage with students, but the way we take their payments and the way we provide them with receipts and the way we um, contract with agents, et cetera. So 
I think a lot of what we've been able to accomplish is contingent and, and has we've been lucky because here we've been able to build those alliances. Uh, there is not a lot of inertia here for what came before. Oh gosh, well, we couldn't do that. We tried it and it wouldn't work. But I think, of course, that's a contingency that we all deal with. Uh, and we're always contingent on resources as well. So uh, final slide for me, opportunities. Uh, and I, I think I spoke about this in a bit more detail a few minutes ago, and that is, how is it that our own department's outcomes can amplify or affirm a strategy goal or outcome? Uh, at Humber, that's been very uh, effective. and We've been able to really leverage our own goals and, and provide, I would say, as I like using the word amplification. So what's the internationalization amplification of the institutional goal? Uh, we've also, um, what, what we try to do is be front of the line for pilot projects that will give us, I would say, procedural technological innovation. So whether it's a, a piece of software, a piece of automation, or it's something that we can do locally uh, and put our heads up and say, we'll be the first to try that. Try that with us. Try that with us, finance department, or try that with us, ID, IT department. So we're first in line to get uh, some relief some more innovative uh, procedure, uh, gives our staff a bit of a boost because there's more automation and less manual work. Uh, I've also found that people are really drawing on their own international expertise to support growth in other areas. Certainly right now, we've caught a lot of conversation about continuous and professional learning globally. And so how can our own, uh, our market expertise globally, how can we help the other areas of the college move ahead? Uh, and one other and final comment, and that is with respect to um, rewarding superb efforts by internal service units. Uh, and I'll, the story I'll use is uh, we have had great success in our capacity development project work. And for our American colleagues, uh, you, you could say that would be um, USAID projects. It's, it's akin to USAID projects. To, so I'm clear about what that means. And in order to be competitive for these projects, we've had to work with the service departments like our legal department or our HR department, our finance department, to have uh, the proposals really spec'd out clearly and have tools in place that really didn't exist before. And, and we've just had such great uh, collaboration and partnerships with those folks. Then when the projects are um, awarded to us, we've been able to really trumpet their work and their innovative work. And, and by and large, that's not something that um, many people haven't the opportunity to do. But I see organizationally, that's actually really helped us not only build alliances, but also um, it's sort of the rising tide floats all boats. It's allowed us to really raise up internationalization and bring folks alongside with us, which has been very, very effective at Humber as well. So I'm looking forward to the discussion, but before we have that, happy to welcome my colleague James uh, Monahan from SIU Ed Edwardsville, and he'll take you through his slides. James. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, as we mentioned, my name is James Monahan, and I'm the Director of Graduate and International Admissions at SIU um, at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, or SIUE, as we say. A uh, little background about SIUE. We are what's considered a doctoral professional university. So we sort of live in that space um, where we do have some doctoral programs, um, but most of them are at the professional level, such as our PharmD program um, and dental medicine. But uh, we do offer a lot of master's degree programs and about 120 different undergrad programs that are scattered across seven academic units. Um, what we're not is we're not a flagship um, institution such as uh, UMass, and we don't have thousands of international students at this time um, like Humber. So um, hopefully my insights might help some of you that are at, at slightly smaller institutions or um, other institutions similar to us. Um, we do have about 13,000 students of which 10,000 are undergrads. And that means we have been traditionally considered a domestic undergrad institution, but that's starting to change. We now have 675 internationals and that's up from 400 where we were for uh, at least a decade, um, you know, uh, where we, we weren't really growing our international and things have changed. And we are in the suburbs of St. Louis. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about our organizational structure. Um, you'll see that green box is graduate and international admissions. That's where I sit, okay? It is only a small part of the SIUE's international 
um, organization. Um, but most of that organization does fall under the provost's office. Um, so you have international affairs, which handles um, the ISSS office, study abroad, university partnerships. Um, and then you have the graduate school, which I work closely with because I'm in charge of graduate admissions. And I will say I'm in charge of both graduate um, domestic and international admissions. And at the international level, um, my office handles both undergrad and graduate. So it is fairly a fairly unusual structure, I think, but we fit within enrollment management. And that sort of helps us out because uh, I deal on a regular basis with my colleagues in undergraduate admissions, and I didn't put our whole structure here, um, but the registrar's office, academic advising, those kinds of units all fit under enrollment management. And that's gonna be key and something that I will talk about. But just to give you an idea, uh, as I said, our office handles the recruitment of new international students and the admission of them, including issuing their I-20s. And then we, once they arrive on campus, we hand them off to the international office where they give them the new student orientation um, and they do the advising for, the, for these students once they've arrived on campus. Next slide, please. So what works? Uh, one thing that really works in our structure is that our admissions policies and pre procedures are very closely aligned with our recruitment efforts because um, admissions and recruitment are together. And I feel that that's really important. Um, it allows us to um, sort of work quickly and make changes. One example I'll give is during the pandemic, um, I'm sure we weren't the only school that added on the Duolingo test as a, as a uh, to provide proof of English language proficiency. We were able to do that quickly. Um, we we're also able to, you know, look at what countries we might accept um, English language without a test. Um, so we're, you know, analyzing some of those in, in countries in Africa that maybe we'll be admitting them without that requirement. And those are things that we see in admission and we see in recruitment. So by having both those units together, it's really um, allowed us to um, align the things that we need to do to grow our international um, population on campus. The combined graduate and international structure, um, you know, that is unusual. And, um, you know, I will say I've got it on both sides here. I've got it on the what works and what doesn't work. Um, the good thing about it is uh, the people that work with me on my team um, to recruit students have to know about our graduate programs. And graduate programs are so diverse, um, that's a really important thing. They need to be able to talk about psychology as easily as they can talk about industrial engineering. And um, by having this graduate structure built together, um, we really learn how those different um, academic units work on our campus, and that helps us in the recruitment process. Um, and then being part of the enrollment management structure also helps us because uh, we can easily work with academic advising to get our new international students advised. Um, and I can do that within the structure that I am in enrollment management. I don't have to go outside, um, and it's sort of, we're sort of all aligned. So that really helps us. What doesn't exactly work for us is, um, as I'm sure you all may use your current students and your alumni to recruit. Because we sort of hand these students off to international services, we don't have as close of access to those students. And so that sometimes causes problems. I've been trying to get an international ambassador program up and running um, to help us with our recruitment efforts. And that's been a little more challenging because of that separation. Um, the other uh, problem is university partnerships fall under international affairs. And I'm not trying to say that all university partnerships should be focused on student recruitment. They actually shouldn't. There are a lot of other really important work that gets done through university, international university partnerships. But recruitment can be one of them, building two plus two programs um, and the things like one plus one programs uh, that were talked about before. And I work very closely with international affairs. These do get done, but it adds another layer. If we're out, if I'm out traveling uh, in another country and I 
visit a university and talk, and then I have to hand them off to international affairs. That can kind of be difficult because you're building up those relationships. So it is something that unlike, since we don't have that structure where um, all the international is under one umbrella, that can cause problems. And then of course, as I said, the flip side, we've got to handle domestic graduate. Um, that's a whole other thing that really doesn't necessarily always fit with international, but I do think that the positives outweigh the negatives in terms of us really knowing our graduate programs well. Um, as far as the contingencies that we talked about, uh, I will state that, that one of the things you have to be careful about if you do have a structure where all your international is in one basket, um, you can kind of silo your efforts. And I think this was, this was acknowledged previously. You can get sort of a group think going. Uh, you know, I always worry that I'm talking to uh, colleagues that I'm close to and we're all on the same side of the issue. We may not see what impact our policies and procedures have on the academic units or some of the other units on campus. So it is important that uh, no matter what your structure is, is that you're working in collaboration. Also financial decision-making, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is extremely important in terms of recruitment, setting tuition rates, whether or not you have scholarships available and what those scholarships are, how you can use them to market. Um, if you have to argue for those research resources, you need to have your data because that is probably not going to be under your control no matter what structure you have. And so make sure that you have the data you need to demonstrate um, how these decisions impact your international recruitment efforts. Um, as far as having uh, external internal factors, domestic and international, I'm sure we're not the only institution that is concerned about um, the enrollment cliff. You may have heard that uh, term that uh, domestic students, at least in the U.S. or in some areas of the U.S., are going to go down. Um, you know, the number of students in high school has been declining for a number of years. In Illinois, we're particularly concerned about this. We're going to be rather <laughs> hard hit on the domestic side. We don't want to lose our enrollment, however. So how do we make sure that we keep that up? Well, increasingly, the administration is turning and looking at the international office at the graduate office um, to keep the overall numbers for the university open. So keep in mind that there are all these external factors going on um, that you need to be aware of. And um, if, you know, as I started at the beginning stating that um, we were more of a domestic undergrad institution, that's starting to change. So we're starting to build the the infrastructure and create the priority for internationalization on our campus that's going to be necessary for the future. And then just a word about outside vendors, things like, like IDP, frankly, um, they can really help you with best practices. They can have these uh, webinars where you can really gain some important insights into what's going to work at your institution. Um, but of course, it isn't, it usually isn't free. So budget is a consideration and you need to uh, choose these carefully and really consider pros and cons of what will work, okay? Um, finally, as far as opportunities go, um, I think I've talked about this enough, but really, you know, we have graduate and international together, not a, a typical idea, but when I first started and with when our international population was rather small, um, we didn't have the staff that we needed to grow the international population. By combining graduate and international, it sort of protects us from some of those ups and downs that you see in international ed or in graduate education. And I was able to argue for additional members on my team um, to get the right size. I mean, I always you know, hear about the one person international office that's out there. Well, what happens when that one person goes on vacation like we all need? Um, who's going to handle the work when it's there? Um, by combining this, we have been able to uh, get the size of our team uh, to a place where we can really serve our students appropriately. Um, uh, I've already talked about having our offices part of a larger division like enrollment management. Um, and I will just say that that also means that you need to look at a variety of strategies, um, you know, while uh, working with IDP can help you. It's not going to be your only solution. You have to look at lots of different things um, 
because different things are going to resonate with your different constituencies. And as we've said again and again, it was one of our truisms, and that is be prepared to collaborate. I really think that's what's going to make you successful. So um, I think we're pushing up against time here. So I'll turn it back over and we'll get to some of the questions that are out there. Thanks. I think you're muted. I am. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, James, Andrew, and Calvin. And now we're going to jump into our panel discussion. We have about 10 minutes left, and I can see a number of questions coming in. So you can keep uh, bringing those in. If we don't have time, maybe we'll have a part two panel discussion another time. So the first question that was sent in that we're going to start with is for you, Drew. Um, and that is, how do you develop your structure to be responsive to change? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. I and I've said this, and some of you on the line may have heard me say this, I hire based on character, and I want people to have the opportunity to innovate. And how does this relate to change? So what that means is try to give people opportunity where they can actually improve their work life in terms of the operations, in terms of their opportunities. And so there's a spirit in the office. There's a spirit in the department, a culture of constant improvement. And I know that we talk about continuous improvement, but and I really believe very strongly that that we have tools all around us that can make our work lives a little easier. I want to empower people, not not engaging IT, but really giving people the opportunity to sort of flourish themselves. And the reason that sets us up well for change is because people are already have a spirit of innovation. They already have a spirit of doing things differently, and they can see opportunities. We also talk a lot about future opportunities. And I'm not talking about just the managers I speak with, but saying to people, look, where's, where's the best opportunity for you to grow? We hope that we can retain people at Humber. Uh, and it may not be possible. And I'm very candid with young staff. In some cases, we can't retain you in this department, but we, we really want you to be successful. So what's best for you as a person? And mm. then, so it's really creating the opportunity where people are saying, I'm valuable. I have the opportunity to, to really innovate and do cool and creative things. I'm still getting lots of work done. I get it done faster or I get it done um, serving students better. Uh, and at the same time, then we, we seem to have a constant flow of uh, really smart young people that are able to move up and step into a new position or adapt to a new work environment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I love that. It's like a sort of a coaching culture, culture of transparency and growth mindset. Um, Wonderful. Okay, for the next question, um, I'm going to pass this over to you, Calvin. So we'll start, and then Jim or Drew, if you want to jump in, please feel free. So what is the connection between your recruitment and admissions team, and how are they managed? So recruitment and admissions at the undergraduate side, as I, I think I mentioned, are, are the same team. They're within uh, the enrollment management team, uh, which is one of the units within the provost's office. So academic affairs, international, my office is within academic affairs, enrollment management is academic affairs. And so undergraduate recruitment and admissions is all one team, uh, which includes the international side of things. On the graduate side, it's an entirely different question. As I said, uh, we don't have any such centralized uh, admissions or strategic thinking. And that's what we've been trying to develop. So uh, from the international office side, um, I've been leading this effort to get some more strategy and oversight of how we recruit, where we recruit, what programs are part of that, what academic units um, kind of want to play in the sandbox of recruitment at the international graduates or in the international graduate space. The admissions are still managed by the, the colleges and the grad school, but we've devised a workflow whereby they can work closely with the commercial partners uh, that we have begun to work with. So our recruitment is entirely external. It's managed through partnerships. We don't have an in-house recruitment team on either side. Great. Thank you. James? Uh, yeah, um, I would just say, as I mentioned, our recruitment and admission is together, and I do think it's a strength. Um, I've worked at other uh, universities where they were separate, and um, I feel that having that really close connection between admissions and recruitment is, is key. 
um, I think it, it gives you a lot of flexibility and it, it allows you to really recruit. Now for us uh, at the undergraduate level in particular, but at the graduate level, yes, um, you are going to be recruiting. You're going to, uh, we have a sort of a hybrid model in terms of whether we're centralized or not uh, at the graduate level. Um, but we do for international, you know, you just can't send every department can't send someone out to recruit internationally. So having uh, and, you know, the recruitment centralized in your international office, I do think is helpful. Um, and it's just important for them to work with those key programs like your engineering programs, like your business programs that you're going to be asked questions of and, uh, you know, make sure that you can answer students' questions as far as you can and that you have a way to connect that student with the academic department because at the graduate level, they want to hear about the particular academic program, um, you know, not whether or not your basketball team is good or, <laughs> you know, those right. kinds of things, which could be more important to the undergrad. The great food that you can get at UMass, you know, that's good, but it's not going to get you international uh, uh, graduate student problem. They're interested in those programs. So you need to have the information with whoever that recruit, wherever that recruitment falls. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James. So moving on to the next question, Drew, I'm going to start with you because this flows from the, the first question that you uh, spoke to us about. So how do you deal with the challenges of turnover within your international team? And, you know, you talked about that transparency and creating a culture of trust. Um, so how do you manage that if you've got these people maybe knowing they're going to flow out of your department onto to perhaps bigger and brighter opportunities because that's what they have to be to do to grow their career? How do you manage the challenge of keeping a good flow of talent going and, and people who have experience? So I would say we, we, we have a, sort of, we're in a uniquely beneficial position in that our international students uh, here at Humber and in Canada, many aspire to stay as permanent residents and ultimately become citizens. So there's a really a, a, a pathway to have young, smart employees come and join the department. Uh, and so that, that's one way that we do that. Uh, I, I would say as well, I was having a conversation with someone earlier today about career aspirations, a former colleague. And, uh, you know, we have um, you've got my eyes on community. Uh, global international education community is a pretty small one uh, here uh, and really maintain relationships with people across a number of institutions. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying in a backhanded way you should poach someone, but frankly, if you have a good opportunity for somebody to really flex and grow their own career. And I, I always think about that and, and talk to people about where their opportunities are, which is the same as me saying to one of my own staff, you know, that is a really good opportunity for you and you should go and do that. So I, I it's a yeah. bit symbiotic. Um, so I, I, I really try and keep an eye on all of that and think down, try to think three or four steps ahead to see, all right, who would be possible for position X or position Y? Great, thank yeah. you. Calvin, did you want to chime in on that? Sure, in the minute and a half we have. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say actually we're in a, diff a different position here and I would say with great difficulty. I think it's, it's no secret that the job market in the US right now is extremely tight and uh, from, the, from the supply side really. And we find it very difficult to uh, manage turnover. So I think what's been key to us is to really think in terms of cross training and the ability for people to step in, trying to sort of make, you know, make folks understand that if they take some extra responsibility now, that may result in a promotion or a reclassification or re-leveling. Now we're hampered also by having an incredibly rigid HR and unionized system here at UMass. On average, um, right now it's taking 12 to 15 weeks just to get a vacant position approved and posted through the HR position. So it's like, I do, I, I, to, turnover keeps me up at night. It's the single biggest thing that yeah. that is a stressor. And so I think anything we can do to create strategies, to retain staff, to cross train them, to have people step into roles um, is really the only effective way for me to manage turnover, right? Thank you so much. So I think we're gonna flow, we're almost at time. We're gonna flow one minute over. Final question, then I'll pass it to Ellie. And so Jim, for the closing question, I'll pass to you. So how do you, you mentioned how you work with IDP Connect. Is there any other partners? How do you work with us? How do you incorporate strategic internal, external partners to assist with things like marketing? Um, 
Yeah, you know, working with IDP has been good. They've, you know, given us ideas on, you know, social media. How can we use social media to reach out to students? Um, we do uh, work with a variety of agents, uh, some big and some small. And uh, I kind of think that's important, at least for a, a university like, like ours. Um, we could get crowded out very easily by the big players, right? Even IDP. We may not stand out because IDP has so many other um, universities that they work with, the big flagship universities. So how do you distinguish yourself? And that's really important. We need to explain to IDP what is great about SIUE, about the great scholarship opportunities so that they can then use that information to work for us and you know, any of the other um, companies that we work with. Um, we need to make sure that we have a good relationship with them, that we're providing them with the information that they need to do their job. So it can work both, you know, it's a mutually beneficial um, arrangement. Um, you know, with IDP, with other universities, you can't always think about what's in it for you. You have to think about what's in it for them as well. And that's when it really starts to work, when you see it as a win-win situation and uh, you can come up with ways to make it. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it's got to be mutually beneficial. So I'll pass it over to Ellie. We have loads of questions. We might have to do a part two. Let us know if you think you would like that. Ellie, over to you. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Everyone. Yes. Thank you so much, Christine. And a massive thank you to our panelists for joining us today. What a dynamic conversation. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to see as you were speaking, but we had a flurry of questions coming in. Tons of interest in this topic. So yes, perhaps we'll have to set up a part two someday um, to dive even deeper into it. So again, thank you all to our attendees for joining us. As we mentioned, this webinar was recorded and we will be sharing the recording and the slides with you following this session. We hope to see many of you very soon at the NAFSA conference. So please do come visit us at our booth, booth P910. And otherwise, we'll thank you again for joining us and we'll see you soon. Take care all. And thanks again to our panelists.